Oceanside Public Library and Oceanside Historical Society recently teamed up to uncover the history of the East Side community. Residents attended the project's finale to celebrate its amazing story. We work with the Historical Society often on programs and uh, I mentioned to Christy that I was interested in doing something about the East Side neighborhood because I live there and also because we serve that community. The East Side neighborhood is always one that I've been interested in, um, but it was kind of by accident when I had a, another program here at the library and I met uh, with Monica Chapo de Marc and uh, we started talking about different program ideas and I did mention to her that I would love to do a program on the East Side neighborhood and then Monica was able to um, uh, hook me up with, with people, residents, uh, because she's a resident herself and we had a workshop and we invited uh, residents from the East Side community to come here to the community room and collect photographs and stories. Christy shared these photos and stories to tell of East Side's history such as when the neighborhood got its affectionate nickname Pozole. There was a lady by the name of Anita Cruz Romero who lived there and um, she had come to Oceanside uh, around the turn of the century and, was, and had bought property. In fact, Mrs. Romero had uh, several pieces of property in Eastside and she was very enterprising. But one of the things that she would do, she would cook the Pozole soup and uh, she would put it in her wagon and go around the neighborhood and say, Pasole, Pasole. And Aurora relayed to me that people would, uh, all over the neighborhood, would buy her suit, but also workers, field workers from Rancho Santa Margarita and around would come to um, enjoy her suit. Many residents contributed photographs to the Eastside History Project, all of which told their personal stories of Eastside. I was born in Oceanside. I was born in 1928 on Archer Street. Uh, right off Mission Avenue, right there behind the Uh I was born in that little house right there in 1928. In 1930, uh, we bought the house on San Diego Street, which is 306 San Diego Street. We bought the house there. And uh, in 1959, I got married and I moved to 709 San Diego Street. Peter Magana married in Eastside's remodeled St. Mary's, the community's first church. Many of you uh, will remember the original St. Mary's. And St. Mary's, of course, is located on 3rd and Dittmar, or Pierview Way in Dittmar. And the original building there you'll see was built in 1893. The original location was on the corner there, and they moved it when the, the new St. Mary's was built. And eventually then this little chapel made its way to Lemon Street. And that's, uh, you'll remember, it's, it's now known as the Lemon Street Chapel. Going to school, uh, the first uh, four years, uh, they had the, what they called the Americanization School. And that school was in existence from 1931 to 1941. I went to that school in 1935, when I was in my first grade. And you had to be seven years old to attend school. Uh, we did not have kindergarten. And if you were of Mexican descent, uh, that's where you went. Whether you could speak English or not, uh, that's where you went. I went to North Oceanside School, which is now Coco's, the restaurant. And then we went to Mission Road School. And then I went to Laurel. We were the first uh, students to be a grand opening for Laurel School. I remember growing up in Oceanside. It was, I had such a good time. You know, it was, we were young, we were innocent, and we just had so much fun there in the neighborhood. The neighborhood, I think, is more integrated now than maybe it, that it was in the 30s and 40s because, of course, again, it was mostly a Mexican-American population. But um, the, the changes, and of course, again, you know, the Laurel School and the community centers, you know, what, what a difference that neighborhood, um, you know, in transforming, even just to get uh, paved streets and a sewer system in the 1950s. Uh, and it, it's changed to a certain extent because, you know, some of those early residents, of course, are now dying out and some of maybe longtime residents are moving out so it's an ever-growing ever-changing community when it was established it was there were a lot of really close-knit families who were just working really hard and doing their best in, in this new place and um, I think it, it went through a time where it got sort of a bad reputation and there's some things that were going on with gang activity and things like that and the gang was real active and they had literally taken over our neighborhood. Our park, Joe Balderova Park, was, uh, was gang turf. But uh, 
us and the, and some of the people that I went to school with, we said, we're not going to stand for this. This is our home. So we got together, commenced to have meetings, and uh, we actually uh, got our neighborhood back. Eastside is one of those communities, just one of those little gems um, that you don't necessarily know about, but it has a story in, it, in and of its own. And, and I just love to be able to um, bring those out and to share them with the public, not only to honor the people of Eastside and give them their due, but then also bring those stories out to share them with the, the rest of the community. There are many untold stories, not only in Eastside, but in all of Oceanside. And the Library and Historical Society will continue to bring these stories back to life. For KOCG, this is Julia Swain. Over 50,000 visitors a year come to Mission San Luis Rey to enjoy its history. Lynette, can you tell us how the Foundation helps preserve this history? Well, we rely heavily on grants as well as donations. We have a dedicated board that has dedicated their time and effort to preserve this for future generations. The Old Mission San Luis Rey Historic Foundation is comprised of a distinguished board. It's made up of eight board members which are comprised of uh, architects, attorneys, and uh, business people throughout the North County. The foundation was created to help fund the physical structures of the museum. Now our foundation is a non-religious organization. We are not affiliated with the Catholic Church or any other church. We are here for the maintenance, preservation, enhancement, and restoration of the old mission San Luis Rey. The mission itself gets no funding from the Catholic Church no funding from the government, no funding from the city. The mission is an independent operation. Due to the lack of federal and private funding to the mission, Old Mission San Luis Rey Historic Foundation was formed. Decisions relating to uh, grants and requests do come from the mission directly through the guardian and the executive director. And they submit to us a list periodically of different areas that they're looking for funds. So we then in turn go out and try to secure grants and or donations uh, any way we can to support their efforts. The foundation is specifically looking for funds to help the mission with city water, with the seismic retrofit, and as you know this is visited by school children every day, many visitors, and we want to make sure that it's totally safe, not to mention all of the artifacts that are housed here at the mission and the museum. Through the support and help of the San Diego Foundation, we're uh, being given direction and planning and support on how to raise the funds. Our initial uh, request at this point would be close to $15 million, that is our goal. The San Diego Foundation is made up of many trusts with assets of over half a million dollars. Income from foundation endowments make grants that are allocated to worthy projects. The San Diego Foundation has been very important to us because they gave us guidance in the very beginning. They helped us with our mission statement. They've helped guide us in a number of, of uh, ideas for fundraising. And they really have been an, an asset to the Mission San Luis Rey Historical Foundation. The Mission San Luis Rey Historic Foundation works to secure grants and raise needed funds to preserve the king of the missions. The old Mission San Luis Rey is a historical treasure because of the many things that have happened over the years. This place back in the 1800s was the social center of this area. This mission predates the town of Oceanside. The mission to me is a place of peace and quiet. If you just come here, sit, meditate, and just think of all the wonderful things that have happened around us over the years. I just feel a closeness to this beautiful location that it, we just can't let it go in disrepair. 
One important project for the foundation is to raise money for earthquake retrofitting. Tom, can you tell us why that project's so important? It's extremely important because where we stand right now is the main portion of the building that could be affected by an earthquake. It would be virtually destroyed. If it's not done by the mandated deadline, number one, there could be heavy fines. And number two, the longer we wait, the more it's going to cost and the problems of safety can multiply. While fresh paint covers up some of the wear, major renovations are needed. We want to preserve this mission for generations to come. It's a, a beautiful historic place and the ambiance here is like no other place in the world. And we want to preserve that for future generations. Here on the Camp Pendleton Marine Base, just north of Oceanside, stands one of California's greatest historical landmarks. It's the Las Flores Adobe, and it's a Monterey-style ranch house that was built in the 1860s. We're here to take you on a private tour. Let's go. This two-story, 15-room adobe sits on 50 acres just inside the Las Pulgas Gate. We met with experts Faye Jonason and Don Hubbs to get a closer look. In 1841, Pio Pico got the land grant for this 125,000 acres. And his brother-in-law, uh, Don Juan Forrester, who had, he was an Englishman, married his sister, purchased all this. He got this piece and gave it to his son as a wedding gift, uh, Marcus Forrester. Mm -hmm. And at that time, they built the, the house, the two-story adobe, in 1860. Las Flores was bought from the Foresters by Richard O'Neill who would then lease it to the McGee family. The O'Neills ran the ranch. It was 125,000 acres. This was 50 acres that they were allowed to, they leased out to the uh, McGee family. Through the times of different owners and residents, this once thriving ranch holds many stories. One of the stories is that Mr. Forrester used to pay people through this window. <laughs> oh, he used to pay them? Mm -hmm. ah. Work workers? Yeah, it would be the McGee workers. And the McGee that, workers? Yeah, that were here. Now the neat thing about this window, if you look here, there's some original writing. Somebody's taking phone messages or whatever, making notes. Those are original to the house, to the McGee time. And if you look at this part, this is what, uh, when they were taking paint samples of the house, trying to figure out what color was there, this is the, the kind of sampling that they did. It's my understanding that the stagecoach line went along the, state, the uh, telegraph lines, and that this was a major station for telegraph. Mm -hmm. So communication came through here. This was a major place. Jane McGee, known as the Lima Bean Queen of Southern California for growing lima beans at Las Flores, lived on the ranch when Camp Pendleton bought the property in 1942. The same year, President Roosevelt himself came to visit. She was concerned that she would have to leave this lease that she had had in her family for so long. Mm -hmm. So uh, President Roosevelt assured her that as so long as someone of her family, of her generation, was living here, they could continue the lease, and they did. In 1969, this became a national uh, registered site, National Historic Landmark. What makes the Las Flores Adobe even more historically significant is that just a few hundred yards north from the house sits the ruins of La Estancia, an adobe built by Native Americans in the 1820s. Richard Rothwell, the president of the Camp Pendleton Historical Society, shared with us its amazing story. Julia, we're standing here uh, at the only remaining portion of a building that dates from around 1823, 1827, thereabouts, called an Estancia. And an Estancia was part of the church system, but it was not a mission or a church. It was sort of an outbuilding where people might stop and uh, get rest as they were going from mission to mission, a place where the local uh, Indians could store their grain, and a chapel where the visiting priest might come and say mass. The first photos were taken in the 1870s, and what this is illustrating is what it looked like um, in 1872 to 1875. Now, there's a lot more in this photograph than there is right here. Right. This is 2008, and all we have left is this little bit. Historically and through the archaeological studies, we think that this was a Lusuenia village of Ushme. And all of the shell is coming from the middens or the kitchen garbage heaps 
right. from shell, from all of the seafood resources, all the plant resources. This place has an incredible story. So part of our job here is to preserve this and to interpret it. What's going on at Las Flores Adobe nowadays? While Camp Pendleton hosts regular tours at the house, it's undergoing lots of restoration to not only preserve the structure, but keep history alive. On this wall, we actually had a crack that went from the very bottom of the floor here all the way uh, to the roof up on the second floor. Uh, this was before the earthquake retrofit, and so what uh, we saw was this huge crack in the wall that was there, but the wall didn't fall down because the wall is so very thick in adobe. Now, one of the things that had to be removed from the adobe walls is concrete. And you can see here we have a real thick slab of concrete. There's some green paint. And on the other side of this, we have wire. Now, this cannot be on adobe walls because this is what prevents the adobe from breathing. And then you're, what you'll have happen is the adobe wall will actually melt on the inside of this, and then the whole structure would just collapse. So this stuff had to be removed, and then on the inside of the wall, steel rebar rods are put in um, because of the earthquake and because of those cracks that Faye was talking about. So this structure should be around for several hundred more years, at least. <laughs> With the renovations that's happened, um, we do have to keep safety in mind. So we've done some renovations, and one of the most important things is the fire suppressant system. To do that and to have as less amount of impact on the building as possible, we had um, Dr. Porter from the University of Vermont, who also has volunteers come and help every year. So they did columns uh, samples to find out how to put the pipes in. And we have not water, but mist. So if there is a fire, um, it's very up to code and very safe. Well, that's it for our tour. Stay tuned in the future for more stories right here on Camp Pendleton. This is Julia Swain. When you think of cemeteries in Oceanside, you probably think of the one at San Luis Rey Mission, founded over 200 years ago, and of Eternal Hills, the new cemetery that opened 60 years ago. But Oceanside has other historic cemeteries with stories to tell. How often do we drive by the cemetery gates, never thinking of all the memories that are buried inside? This is Oceanside's Ocean View Cemetery. It was established almost 115 years ago. The Ocean View Cemetery was established in 1895, and the first owners were the Oddfellows, so the cemetery was referred to as Oddfellows Cemetery, or even the IOOF. It was the first cemetery in Oceanside city limits, but this was considered still out of town because the center of Oceanside was at Mission and Hill, and if you wanted to bury your loved ones, you had to either go out all the way to the San Luis Rey Valley, or to the Buena Vista Cemetery out on Vista Way, which was at that time called Wall Street. So Ocean View Cemetery was closer for um, residents to bury their loved ones, but it also became uh, a burial place for people in Carlsbad, Vista, and even as far down as Encinitas and Solana Beach. The Brody family, the Hayes family, the Fusat family are buried here. It's a who's who of Oceanside when you walk these rows. Christy Hawthorne of Oceanside's Historical Society says some of the earliest residents to be buried here at Ocean View, like George Bronson, were moved from the Buena Vista Cemetery. This plaque is all that remains of the Buena Vista Cemetery, which was established in 1888 and then bulldozed to make way for the Hunter Restaurant in 1970. Christie says records show 45 people were buried in Buena Vista in the late 1800s, and only about half of them were disinterred and moved when the road was widened. We believe that there could be at least a half a dozen people still buried at the Hungry Hunter restaurant property. Restaurant employees say they believe it. Bartender Kathy Henry says people have seen lights, smelled burning, and heard voices in the empty restaurant at night. The assistant manager was working in the bar one night and it was 2 o'clock in the morning. There was absolutely no one in the restaurant. He was cleaning the floor and he distinctly heard his name and it scared him so badly. He locked the door and he left and he never came back. It scared him so badly. So there's just things, yes, that have gone on <laughs> that you can't explain. So we think it's haunted. 
The dead may be restless at the Hunter Inn, but they certainly rest in peace at the Mission Saint Louis Ray. The cemetery originated when the friars founded the mission around 1798. And when they came here and began a community with the Indians, they helped the Indians change their, many of their ways of doing, whether it was from farming to religious practices or to the burial of their dead. Before the friars came, the Indians would cremate their dead. After the friars came, even though they didn't put markers on the graves, they started to bury their dead in the cemetery plots. A monument honors the Indians who died while working with the mission. The friars have created a cemetery that welcomes the living as well as the dead. It's like a park and people love to come here. We're very open to however you want to mark the graves of your loved ones. The friars are also open about who they bury in their cemetery. It doesn't matter if you're Catholic, Jewish, or Buddhist. All are welcome to find a final resting place here. And the monks are keeping up with the changing times. They plan to expand the cemetery soon to offer what they call green burials. It'd be like an oak grove, small oak grove, and one would be buried there totally according to green techniques, which means there would be no casket. You'd actually be wrapped in cloth and you would become part of the ground, much as the Indians originally did back in the late 1700s and early 1800s. Funny how things come full circle. The skull and crossbones over the cemetery gate was put there by Disney when they shot the movie Zorro at San Luis Rey. While it was there for a movie, it is actually very appropriate for a Franciscan cemetery because it was very common for St. Francis and many people, uh, holy people at his time, to constantly reflect on the imminent nature of their own death as a way of pursuing the spiritual life. It's a beautiful thing actually to have spiritually for us uh, to just remember that none of us know the time or the day. Just around the corner from San Luis Rey Mission is another much smaller cemetery, but you don't want to miss it. It's the All Saints Episcopal Cemetery. This little church and cemetery was started by some English settlers. Where they heard about the cheap farmland in this valley, and they came over from England, purchased this, and thought they'd be farmers, but they weren't very good farmers. But at any rate, they established this little church uh, and built the church in 1890 and had the first service in the church on Christmas Eve of 1890. James Harper, known to his friends as Rip, lovingly takes care of the small cemetery with its 432 graves. Its tiny church, made of redwood, still has the original wooden pews from the late 1890s. This is the organ that played here for the first service, second hand, from a Catholic mission down in San Diego, and we still use it today. It's a pump organ, and uh, the same lady plays it for us now, has been playing it for about 25 years. Only those who have relatives already buried in this cemetery are eligible to be buried here, plus the Episcopal Diocese and a few parishes have plots. My lot is right here where my wife is, right there. I go by Rip, and so I had it put on this tune, so my name is already there. It's everything except the date of my death, and I hope that isn't too soon. But I'm still young. I'm only... 91 years, uh, 7 months, and 20 days today. <laughs> Here's one man who knows cemeteries are not scary places to be. They help keep memories of history alive, and they remind us of what's in the future for all of us. Oceanside's Pier is the city's most recognizable and popular landmark. But what most residents don't know is that it's celebrating its 120-year-long history this year. And this is actually the sixth pier that Oceanside has had. The first one was built in the year 1888. A great place to begin our journey back in history was at the Oceanside Historical Society, where we had a chance to meet with President Christy Hawthorne. The first pier was built in 1888 and was at the end of Cout Street. And uh, Couts is now known as Wisconsin Street. Uh, it lasted a very short time because uh, it was probably built too low to the water. And the first or second storm of the year actually washed it out. The second pier was completed in September of 1894 and was named the Little Iron Wharf, not only because it was very short, but because its pilings were made of iron for strength. 
Up here lasted until uh, about 1900, and it was still standing, but the town was clamoring for a third pier. And by 1903, they built a new pier, and this time the pier was called the Steel Wharf. And the reason why it was called the Steel Wharf is because the city of Oceanside purchased um, steel from the railway, and uh, some of those pilings were actually um, steel rail from, from the railway, and it was, uh, I think, to the length of 1,900 feet. But even with steel to strengthen Pier Number 3, the Pacific eventually tore it down, and Number 4 was created in 1947 with cement walkways at its base, similar to those of today's pier. However, like all the piers before it, the 1927 pier's demise was that of storms, destroying it in 1947. The fifth pier, a huge celebration for Oceanside, would last nearly 40 years. But by the 70s, uh, the, the storms, the tide, it began to take its toll on this particular pier. Uh, we, started, we lost the bait shop at the very end. We started to lose pilings. And little by little, the waves whittled this particular pier away. And so, Oceanside began construction on its sixth and final pier. We got in touch with Jack Good, Tim Umberger, and Chuck Glenn of Good and Roberts, the company that built the present cement walkways, the lifeguard tower and bait shop, and of course, Ruby's Diner. It took approximately a, one year to do the entire thing. Our contract was just for the concrete portion of the pier, the lifeguard station, and refurbishing the wooden or the uh, concrete portion, and then we built the buildings on the pier. We uh, not only did a lot of, of uh, reworking of the concrete foundations on the, on the end of the pier, on the street side, but uh, a lot of the timbers were replaced. Uh, the lifeguard tower was replaced. We built a, a facility or a building on the very end of the pier to house a, a restaurant of some kind. The, the pier is built with wood piles. They are... Um, they're encased in a, in a rubber coating for protection from the, from the elements of the water. They're driven into the sand base and uh, to a point of uh, so many blows per inch, which means that they've reached their maximum strength spot, their, their bearing. And uh, the only weakness is that over time those wood piles will deteriorate as they did before. And then they'll do the same thing again. But it's probably another 20 or 30 years before that happens or possibly a large storm. The location of the towers midway down the pier was based on the surf line. Lifeguards could patrol upstairs and their equipment and the bait shop were down below. Now the pier could serve several purposes with the new additions Good and Roberts would build on it. This pier is built to house many people on the pier. There's, you can put vehicle traffic on this pier, no problem. The sixth pier we know today celebrated its grand opening on September 29, 1987. As part of that celebration, residents were given a chance to have their names carved onto the pier's wooden railings for a $25 donation. These engravings are still visible today and serve as a remembrance of the day Oceanside spent celebrating its newest wooden pier, the longest on the West Coast. The, the pier is a wonderful outlet. It's a great outlet uh, just to come down and enjoy a day, take a walk. Come down and have a lunch. Uh, we've always enjoyed being on the water and uh, this is a great, great way to enjoy it. Kids, families love to walk along the pier. The couples, it's a very romantic walk to walk out into the sunset, walk to the ocean, look back at Oceanside. It's just, it's a very fun aspect. The highlight of any trip, any visit to Oceanside is walking out to the pier and getting that feel of what Oceanside is all about. And that concludes our look back at the pier's 120-year-long history. This is Julia Swain for Inside Oceanside. <laughs>